real pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Allison Adams. Uh, and I owe uh, a huge grat of, uh, debt of gratitude to Allison because Allison is really, n Allison's one of the people who's not a bird scientist, but she has this, what she's working on now is so important to us. And so I think it was, she, her arm was twisted to show up to a bird conservation <laughs> session, but I'm so grateful because uh, this is really important because what Allison's going to be able to sort of get us thinking about is the spatial context for what we're doing. Uh, because these forests aren't static, they're always changing. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison. I should have mentioned Allison is a uh, PhD student in the Gund uh, School of Environment? Institute. I'm Institute in the Rubenstein of, School okay. and at the Gund Institute. It's complicated. It is, it is complicated. <laughs> Allison, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, John. Um, so, yeah, today I'm really excited to talk about work that I actually did for my master's research um, with Jen Pontius and David Gudex Cross, um, looking at remote sensing and what it can tell us about how the forests are changing across the region, both in terms of composition and in terms of spatial extent. Um, and as John sort of alluded to, it may seem a little strange that we're here in a bird session, um, but as ornithologists know, the patterns of the forest and the species that are in the forest are really important for bird populations. And so I'm excited to talk about the work that we've done and connect that to some of the existing research and what we know already about how birds respond to these kinds of things. So this work stems from a research project funded by the Northern States Research Cooperative. And um, the goal was really to develop improved methods to map forest species composition um, and forest cover and apply those techniques across um, a 30-year historical period and also project some of those changes into the future to see how these changes are affecting um, the landscape. And then, like I said today, I'll also talk about how they're affecting bird populations. And, um, this example that's shown on the bottom that maybe you guys can kind of see it's a little bit fuzzy, but this sh just shows how quickly the landscape is changing over this time period. So this is just about 10 years, and you can see this in New Hampshire, that there's a huge amount of fragmentation happening in the landscape over just that amount of time. So when we talk about patterns over a 30-year historical period, it's even more extreme. And then when we start to project into the future, we're really seeing substantial fragmentation of the landscape as well as changes in species composition due to climate factors. So today I'm actually going to be talking about two separate projects. One is, well, they're not separate, they're connected, but one is looking at the changes in species composition of the forest over this time period, and then also looking at the changes in forest extent. So I'll start with the species composition ones. Um, so I'm going to, I should mention, I'm also going to gloss over the methods a little bit, just because I don't think you guys are that interested in all the little remote sensing nitty gritty, but if you do want to know about that, feel free to talk to me or Jen Pontius about the details of how we did that. Um, and yeah, so like I mentioned, we use a novel remote sensing approach that combines both, both pixel-based and object-based methods to come up with maps of species distribution across the landscape. And the pixel-based method was a spectral and mixing method that allowed us to get maps of species-specific percent basal area maps across the region that we were mapping. So the northern forest region, um, looking at parts of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and parts of Maine. Um, and then we use the object-based classification to scale those maps up to get sort of uh, maps of forest at the forest stand level. So looking at what are sort of the dominant species and getting more of a categorical map that people might be more used to working with. So, like I mentioned, we found that using this novel approach, we could map not only species distribution, but also species abundance, um, resulting in these percent basal area maps that we then use to examine how species composition has changed over the past 30 years and begin to explore why these changes might be happening. Um, so what I want to point out is that we were actually able to map percent basal area within 10% even, uh, even in these very heterogeneous mixed forests. So that's pretty exciting, um, and, and there's a lot of power in what we're able to do with these kinds of maps. Um, and accuracy is obviously highest for the species that are the most common because we, we used training plots to parameterize these models and those are the ones that we have the best data for. So we um, detected, uh, like, it, like it says here, we detected significant region-wide reductions in sugar maple, eastern hemlock, balsam fir, and birches, and increases in American beech and red maple. So some of this is what you would expect. You would expect to see changes from early successional to later successional species, so maybe a decrease in birches and an increase in American beech over time. That might be what you'd expect. 
But shade, losses in shade tolerant species, species like eastern hemlock and sugar maple suggest that there's something else going on here that's driving these changes. And we'll get into that. It seems to be climate. Big surprise. <laughs> Um, and it's important to note that these changes were not uniform across the landscape, um, but many of the changes that we did see were in locations where two common compatriot species occupied the same forest. So for example, sugar maple and beech, or spruce and fir. And so in these locations, we saw connected opposing patterns, which indicates that there may be sort of competitive dynamics at play here, and that that's really influencing some of what's going on here, and that may be influenced by climate. So. Um, to interpret this a little bit for you, you have sugar maple up here at American Beach, and you can see the blue spots are where you're losing sugar maple, and the red spots are where you're gaining it. And you can see, sort of see a, a reverse of that pattern for beach, and then you can see some of the same patterns for um, balsam fir and red spruce. And then looking at, we also looked at uh, potential drivers of these changes and found a couple interesting things. So one is that um, different species appear to be sensitive to different conditions. So for some species like eastern hemlock, this seems to be tied to things like water availability, while for others like balsam fir, it's more tied to temperature extremes. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that we did include a lot of other things like soils, topography, stand, um, we use pollution metrics, but what really comes out most often is the climate metrics, which suggests that climate is really driving a lot of what, a lot of the changes that we're seeing in these species across this part of the landscape. But so I promised I would connect this back to birds. Um, <laughs> so what does this mean for, for birds? Um, like I said, we, we didn't look specifically at how these connections, how these changes connect to avian populations, but we can draw some conclusions from the literature on how changing, changes in tree species might affect bird populations. So some of the things that we found that might be relevant are, are mentioned here, so that eastern populations of several bird species associated with spru spruce for fir forests have also experienced declining populations. Um, the USGS Breeding Bird Survey data corroborate these significant declines in abundance for 11 of 17 spruce fir bird species. So those changes in spruce fir may be really significant for bird species in this region. Um, Bicknell's thrush is one of the species at the greatest risk with declines across the region. Um, and then similarly, spruce grouse, which is endangered in New York, um, has had significant declines over the last 30 years. So we see changes in bird species that seem to sort of go along with these changes in tree species over this time period. Okay, so moving on to project two. So this project was really looking at forest extent and fragmentation of the forest across the landscape. And the idea was to look at historical patterns of change over this region over the past 30 years, and also look at other things that may be correlated with where those changes are happening and use that information to project where we might see changes in the future. So to do this first, we had to develop our forest cover maps. These, these are um, actually the species maps that I was mentioning in the previous um, section of this project. So um, the ones that we developed through the NRS, NSRC project are here the biggest, and that's comparing to other commonly used forest cover maps. Um, I just want to show this to you because it's really cool that it's much more specific and they also tend to be more accurate, which is really exciting. Um, but what we did to do this, the mapping of forest extent, is we took the map that we had of all these different species and just combined it all into forest, non-forest classes. And that's what we started with. This is, this is sort of a breakdown of the method, but I'll explain this to you because this is a lot to digest at once. So the first step in, in building these models is calculating just the historical rates of transition between land cover types. So between out of forest and into non-forest, and then also from non-forest to forest. Just how much land actually changed from each in each of those categories. Then we looked at all of this, the drivers of change that we thought might be influencing this. So all the different spatial variables that we could find. And the cool thing about this model is you can put in anything you can think of. Like just put it in, it'll tell you whether or not it's significant, so you might as well just try it. So we tried lots of different um, land cover variables across that this region to see if any of those were correlated with the places where we were seeing those transitions mm -hmm. over that historical period. And then what you do is you run that simulation. So we, we broke up our 30-year historical period into two time periods, 1985 to 2000 and 2000 to 2015. So we parameterized the model in 19, 1985 to 2000, but then we actually ran it for 2000 to 2015 and compared both the observed 2015 map with the one that we created so that we could see how well our model was doing. Um, and you're not going to be able to see this, but this tiny little chart at the bottom is um, how well our models did. And um, 
without going into a ton of detail, there's a lot of variability in how accurate you are just depending on how you measure your accuracy. So you use a window of, of varying sizes and how, how big the window is affects how accurate your maps appear to be, right? You're not likely to create a simulated map that's accurate one-to-one, -one, but you might predict forest conversion close enough that you can count that as accurate. We're dealing with 30 by 30 meter pixels. Getting right on the pixel would be really, really hard to do. Um, so you actually create windows of varying sizes and then try to hit a certain threshold. Um, and then there's also, you can count maximum and minimum similarity. I won't go into it. There's a lot of different ways that you can look at this, um, but that's why you see all these varying measures of accuracy. Um, the maps were not, they're not super, super accurate. Part of that is because, it, like to the specific location, Part of that is because over the entire large forest area that we have, not that much forest is changing. And so there's some randomness in the model where it just has to kind of pick a location, and it's not going to get that perfect. But that's okay, because what we do is we run the simulation lots of times to get a map of probability of how likely that spot is to change. So overall, if we look, run this many, many times, what are the places that are consistently changing, and what are the ones that are not changing that consistently? So we can get a sense of the probability of conversion across the entire landscape. And those are the maps that we really want to use if we're putting them into like a decision support tool, for example. We want to put in the probability maps, not one random simulated map. So one of the things we find in terms of fragmentation is that while the rates of forest, of the amount of forests that are converting change over time, for example, we see from 1985 to 2000 a fair amount of forest loss, whereas from 2000 to 2015 you actually get a net amount of forest gain historically, but even during that time period we still see measures of fragmentation increasing. So even though we gained some forest between 2000 and 2015, it wasn't necessarily in places that actually made the forest more connected. So we see these increasing measures of fragmentation across the entire landscape. We see that both over histor the historical period and through the, the projected period. And we looked at for main forest patch size, standard deviation of the patch size, forest edge, edge density, and total core forest area. And each of these predicted basically increasing fragmentation. You interpret them in different directions depending on the metric. But they all said, yep, fragmentation is increasing. Um, and while we, we did include a, a suite of possible correlates and many of them were significant, there were a few that came out as much more significant for driving these changes than others. And not super surprisingly, many of them seem to indicate that development is really what's driving this change in the region. So we see that places with pop higher population densities are more likely to change, places that are closer to roads are more likely to change. Um, some of these it should be shallower, not steeper slopes are more likely to change, um, lower elevations, um, and places that are closer to urban areas, and then with un unenrolled conservation status. So these are all, there's two good things about this. Well, one good thing is that it suggests the model is working, right? This is what we would expect, and it's pulling out drivers of development as important. Um, and then it also just shows, okay, this is really like a, a single trend that's really driving a lot of the, the conversion that we see. And one thing I want to mention that just sort of corroborates this is we compared this to the housing price index for this region across this time period and find that these patterns match up pretty well. So this, this is actually showing um, the percent change in the price of houses, not just the straight price of, that, that, of houses. So what you see is that we have increasing price of houses um, over the time period where we see increasing forest conversion, that historical period. And then that time period, 2000 to 2015, where we see a little bit of net forest gain was actually correlated with the um, housing crisis, right? So that's why we, we see that, in fact, these development pressures probably are driving a lot of this change in this region. Um, and then a, one thing I do want to mention is that it's not uniform across the region. So it's kind of hard to see some of these patterns. Blue is water, green is forest, brown is development. Um, but in the Adirondacks, for example, we actually see forest regeneration. There's a lot of forest coming back in the Adirondacks. That seems to be the dominant trend in that region. Whereas this is um, showing Burlington in the bottom. We see increasing development um, and fragmentation of forests in Burlington. Another place where that's happening a lot is the coast of Maine. We saw that as a very likely place to convert as well. Okay, so connections to birds. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so this, again, this work didn't look specifically at how this forest fragmentation affects bird populations, but again, we can go into the literature and draw some conclusions. The vast majority of the work has been conducted in tropical and subtropical landscapes, so we have to take, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but um, here's a selection of some things that seem connected to these patterns. So one is that the abundance of almost every bird species breeding in the interior of upland forests um, 
was found by um, Lynch and, and Wiggum to be significantly influenced by forest area isolation um, and then some other metrics as well. So that suggests that these fragmentation, this increasing pattern of fragmentation could have a significant impact on bird populations. Um, also, that, that uh, maintaining a viable breeding population of migratory songbirds in the north um, is really connected to avoiding fragment fragmenting of forests. Uh, and there are some other relationships as well about um, just you know, fragment, fragments of landscapes and breeding bird populations. So there does seem to be this pretty strong connection between keeping the forest intact, as a lot of people have, have alluded to today, and maintaining bird populations. Um, so clearly, fragmentation is really important for managing avian populations. Um, but how can we get this information to, out to people for, who are actually going to use it and be able to make decisions based on it? Um, and the really exciting thing is that a uh, decision support tool that incorporates this information is currently development, in development and is um, expected to be ready live in about June. So um, I'll talk just briefly about that. So um, the tool allows us to aggregate various geospatial data layers. So this isn't the only one. There's a whole team of people who have been working on this um, to identify locations, or in this case, parcels of, of highest value for our management and conservation activities. Um, and this is, I think this is the image I want. Yep, in this image, red indicates places that are higher priority to conserve. They're high quality, high conversion risk habitats. So you'd be able to use this to kind of identify what are some parcels that are under a lot of risk for conversion and are also valuable for a lot of other reasons and should we try to protect those places first. And with that, I'll conclude. I'm really excited to have gotten a chance to share this with you guys and connect it to a topic I don't ever think about, which is birds. It's really fun. Um, if you want any more information, feel free to get in touch with me or with Jen. Great uh, for giving us a new context on this and some really important information. So we have um, just a couple minutes if there's any questions for uh, Allison. So I was just wondering when you were on the fragmentation part, if you had any distinction between sort of permanent fragmentation, like a parking lot or whatever, mm. versus like something like you know a small clear cut or a log landing that might grow back into forest. If there's any way to do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. For that particular product, we didn't do that, um, but we're currently in the process of expanding the, um, because of the Landsat tiles that we use, we don't have Southern Vermont in that, there's parts of the state that we don't have in other parts of the New England region that we didn't include. So we're currently in the process of expanding it and they tend to include a couple different non-forest land cover types there that might get at that idea. So is it developed or is it you know, cropland, like maybe getting into some of these things about whether it's been permanently converted. This yeah. is a non-verb question, if that's okay. Great. Yeah, that's perfect, because I don't know how I was words. wondering if you're looking at the um, impact of uh, browsing, specifically deer browsing. I'm thinking of the inverse relationship between beach and sugar maple, because sugar maple is preferentially browsed as opposed to beach, and the fact that the beach went up and the sugar maple went down might be a classic indication of browsing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, the answer is no, we didn't look at that. This was much more of sort of a macro scale, like landscape level dynamics rather than those sort of more stand level or species driven dynamics. Um, but that's a really interesting point. It's something that um, I hadn't considered that might be driving that change. Okay. All right, thank you right. so much. Thank you.